Hi, I'm Alex Idris, and thanks for joining us tonight for Bold Method Live IFR. We're going to talk about MDA, DA, and visual descent points, and how to use each one of the three. These are something that kind of confuse both instrument students and instrument pilots alike. And well, on the face, they seem fairly simple. There are some key differences that really affect the way we fly. And considering when you're at MDA or DA, you're essentially as close to an obstacle as you possibly will ever get while still remaining protected. Uh, it really is important to understand the nuances of each. So that's what we're gonna go through tonight. We've got Corey, Corey Cormeric on chat, and as you have questions, send them out to him. He'll forward them over to Colin Cutler, who's our technical director, and then he'll bring them online in the presentation. We have lots of time for questions tonight. So if I lose you anywhere, or if you want me to go into more detail, jump in right away. Don't wait till the end of the presentation. Okay, so we'll start with a quick overview of MDA, then we'll talk a little bit about visual descent points and continuous descents on final approaches. We'll talk about what happens if we go missed. Then we'll move into decision altitude, uh, and we'll also cover what you need to see to be able to go below either DA or MDA. But let's start with the basics, and that really is the definition of minimum descent altitude. So, MDA also known as minimum descent altitude, it's the lowest altitude expressed in feet above mean sea level to which a descent is authorized on final approach or during a circular land maneuver in, execute, in execution of a standard instrument approach procedure where no electronic glide slope is provided. That's right out of the aim. To simplify that a little bit, essentially we look at that as the minimum altitude that you can descend to, we typically say, on a non-precision approach. Not an approach with vertical guidance, uh, not a precision approach, but what we typically say a non-precision approach. One of the things that I really like to clarify, um, if you've got a plus V GPS equipped aircraft, so let's say you're flying a G1000 with WAS uh, or a different Garmin unit with WAS or an Aberdyne with WAS, oftentimes as you load a procedure, you'll see the option to fly a plus V. And your, your GPS will provide what we call plus V or advisory vertical guidance. It's not a certified glide path. And so you're still essentially using an MDA, a minimum descent altitude. Okay, let's compare that to a DA or a decision altitude. A decision altitude is a specified altitude or height um, in, the, in the precision approach at which, at which a missed approach must be initiated if the required visual reference to continue the approach has not been established. Okay, and that is one of the big things that separates an MDA and a DA. An MDA is just an altitude limit. It has nothing to do with action. You have to level out there until you meet requirements to send below, but you can continue flying along at MDA until you reach your missed approach point. Decision altitude is both an altitude limit in sorts, but at the same time, it is your missed approach point. So when you're flying either an APV, approach with vertical, uh, approach with vertical guidance, um, or you're flying a precision approach, down to the point where you have a DA, your missed approach point is your DA it's no longer the missed approach point that's published on the chart. So people get very confused about that. They say, well, there's a separate map published on the chart. That's true. That's for a non-precision approach. Your missed approach point when you have a DA is your decision altitude. Okay, so with all of that, what is a visual descent point? So a visual descent point or a VDP is a defined point on the final approach course of a non-precision straight in approach procedure from which a normal descent from the MDA to the runway touchdown point may be commenced, providing that the approach threshold of that runway or the lights or the other markings identifiable with the approach end of the runway are clearly visible to the pilot. So that really brings up, okay, so what is, we'll get into VDPs in just a little bit more of a second, but what do you need to do or to have to go below DA or MDA? Well, there's three things. Number one, you need to have continuous position to land on the intended, or continuous position to land on the intended runway. So essentially what we're saying is that you should be able to make a normal and continuous descent 
down to land on the runway. What is normal? That's up to you. Three degrees? Sure. Could it be four and a half? Absolutely. Could it be six? If you feel that that's normal. The FAA essentially allows the pilot to determine when a descent is normal. And this is something that you really need to know both your skills and your aircraft's capabilities. We'll talk about this in a second, but on minimum descent altitudes, you could fly so far towards the missed approach point and close to the runway threshold that getting from the minimum descent altitude down to the runway may not be very practical. And if you try, you could put yourself in a very awkward place. And we'll talk about that more in a little bit of a second. But essentially, you need to be in a normal and continuous position to descend and land on the runway. Okay, number two, what you need is required flight visibility. This one is really important because we include the word flight. There was a time where that really wasn't included and it left us a little more ambiguous. But now we clearly say flight visibility. And so that means under part 91, okay, when we're flying under part 91 in a cat one approach, we don't need an RVR reading. We don't need a prevailing visibility reading to land. What we need to do is use our eyes and determine how far we can see. And there's times that you can trust RVR and prevailing visibility and there's times you can't. Uh, I've flown approaches in the Northwest where RVR says there's less than a quarter mile of fog, uh, or prevailing visibility says that, and the runway is completely clear because the fog bank is sitting 12 feet off to the side right on top of the measuring equipment. I've flown other cases where they're reporting two miles visibility, but I can't see anything other than maybe a light on the runway, but I clearly can't see further down it. And so in that case, I don't have the visibility to land, even though the reporting systems say that it's there. And so that's one of the things we tell people, category or, or part 91, you are essentially, you need to rely on your eyes. And there's a couple of different tricks you can use. You can look at the runway length. You know, the runway itself at 6,000 feet is about a mile. You can jug your distance from the runway. These are all good ways to determine flight visibility. But you need to have your minimums in flight visibility, not in reported visibility. Okay, and the third item on there is that you need to have the runway environment in sight. And there are 10 things that the FAA calls the runway environment. Here's the first, uh, I think we're coming into, was this San Luis Obispo, Colin? It was, yeah. Okay, so San Luis Obispo, and we could see that right there, that little white cross. You can see, that is a big arrow. I'll shrink that down a little bit. Yeah, you can see this little white cross right here. That is the medium intensity approach lighting system, Mouser and it's got alignment lights, okay? So there are a runway alignment indicator lights, so the rabbit. This is just a steady picture, but you can see that bright strobe flashing that leads me in. You'll notice that's really all I can see. Uh, if you really study the picture, maybe you can kind of see a threshold, but I wouldn't say clearly, but I can clearly see the white approach lights. That allows me to go down to 100 feet above the touchdown zone elevation. And if you're an instrument student, this is one thing I always tell you to be careful about when you say it, because we often think about this when we're looking at a precision approach, an ILS. And an ILS typically takes us down to around 200 feet above the ground. So people say, well, you can go down another 100 feet on an ILS if you see the white approach lights. That's true if the ILS stops at 200 feet. But it's really not you can go down an extra 100 feet. It's that you can go all the way down to 100 feet above touchdown zone elevation. And it's not just on a precision approach, it's on any approach. You can get down to 100 feet above touchdown zone elevation if you see the white approach lights. Okay, so what's it take to get you all the way down to land? Well, in the approach lighting system, one of them is the red side row bars. You can see them here. Um, these are typically you're going to find these more on ALSIF 1 and 2 systems. Uh, they're typically not found at small airports, so air carrier airports, typically with category 2 or 3 approaches. Uh, the red terminating bars, so these end bars here. If you see red approach lights, that means you can continue down to land. Your other items are the threshold, the white beginning of the runway. The threshold markings themselves, so you can see essentially those, those bars that you see right before the numbers and the green threshold lights. Those would count to get you all the way down to the ground. The runway end identifier lights, REILs, 
Those are those flashing strobe lights that you see off to the sides of the runway. This is something you want to be a little bit careful about because runway end identifier lights, rails, sound like runway alignment indicator lights, are AILS. Our AILS is the rabbit that leads you in, that strobe that sequences you in. You can get down to 100 feet above touchdown zone elevation. Our EILS, rails, the little flashing lights at the end of the runway, those will get you all the way down to the pavement. And then the other thing you want to watch for is you need to know the approach lighting system at the airport because you could mistake possibly our EILS for ODALs, the omnidirectional flashing lights. And if you don't see anything other than the ODAL lights, which are flashing, that won't get you all the way down. ODALs are an independent runway lighting system. So when you're flying approach, this is why we always brief the approach lighting system. So we know what we're looking for. And so when we see it, we know if that allows us to go down to 100 feet above touchdown or all the way down to the runway. Okay, what else could you see? You could see the visual glide slope indicator. Here, we've uh, shown a VASI, but it could be a PAPI or any other certified uh, glide slope indicator on the side of the runway. The touchdown zone um, or the touchdown zone markings. So those are those markings that you see stretching down to the aiming point markings. And then the touchdown zone lights, which are basically thick bars of lights that run from the threshold down the runway. Then we have the runway itself or the runway's markings. So any of the paint on the runway, whether it's the numbers, the aiming point markings, or the stripes, as long as those are clearly visible. And then finally, the runway lights itself. And so the runway lights, you know, we're really talking about the, the edge lights on the runway, uh, but it could be, you know, of course, also the green threshold light that starts the runway. You'll notice here that things like wind socks or taxiway lights, those don't count. And that's because that's not part of the runway environment itself. You may see the airport environment, but you need to see the runway environment to descend below MDA and land. And so that's, that's an important distinction. And it's really important, again, as I said, to know what you're looking for before you're looking for it. Uh, it makes it easier to understand, if, especially with an approach lighting system, if you need to level out at 100 feet or if you can take it all the way to the ground. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about how we're going to use this with the minimum descent altitude. And what we're going to do is look at the rules of an MDA. Then we're going to talk about a visual descent point. We'll briefly look at how to calculate one. And then we'll talk about a continuous descent on final approach. And then finally, we'll move from there into what happens if we go miss. And then we'll go on to the decision altitude. Okay, so let's take a look at a minimum descent altitude. Essentially, uh, this is the, Colin, is this the uh, uh, VOR? VOR to 2.3 at... Uh, in Scotts Bluff. Scotts Bluff, yeah. Okay, so the VOR to 2.3 in Scotts Bluff. And essentially, once you cross the final approach fix, and if you're unfamiliar with the Jeppesen chart, the Maltese cross is our final approach fix, then we can descend down to our minimum descent altitude. You'll notice that there's a couple things listed on here. We have a V. That's a visual descent point. We have an M. That's a required missed approach point. And you'll notice on this Jepson chart, we also have an angle with a dash and some dots that come after. That is our vertical descent angle if we were flying a continuous descent on final approach. But at the bare minimum, what we need to do is get down to the MDA and then drive the airplane in. And we can continue to remain at MDA all the way till we reach the missed approach point. Okay, so again, it's important to remember that you can't go below MDA in this maneuver. So you need to start your power application to level the aircraft out before you get to MDA. But then from there, the FAA just says, yeah, you can continue along your final approach course at MDA all the way until you reach the missed approach point. So looking back at that, the question starts to become, when can the airplane land? And if we use this dive and drive method, it can actually be a little bit difficult to tell when the aircraft can land. So for example, if we see, start to see the runway here, let's say we're three miles from the runway, should we start our descent down? Well, if we have the runway in sight, but maybe not the Pappy or the Vazi, it can be very difficult to judge our descent angle. And if you look at this, we're gonna be at significantly shallower than a three degree descent angle. So probably not a good normal descent to landing. The visual descent point 
is not published on every procedure. When it is, it generally lines up with or is close to the visual glide slope indicators, but not always. It provides essentially a normal descent down to the touchdown zone for landing. So for a lot of transport category operations, the VDP is mandatory. That's where they will depart MDA and descend down to the runway if they meet landing requirements. That's their continuous position for a normal descent to landing, the VDP. And then all they need is required flight visibility and the runway environment and clear sight, okay? Under Part 91, we're not required to use a VDP at all. It's just simply a little piece of advice. But you really should think about it as not mandatory, but, but a really, really important suggestion. What it really means is if you haven't reached the VDP yet and you're flying a straight-in procedure, even if you see the runway, you probably shouldn't get below MDA because you're not in a normal position to land. The question is, what happens if you're past the visual descent point? So let's go back to this. Once you move past the visual descent point, you haven't necessarily reached the missed approach point. But if you were to try to descend from MDA, who knows how steep that descent could be down to the ground? The question is, you're moving along too quickly to really figure out what kind of descent rate you would need. Okay, you really don't know, you know, is this something where I can make it in a 700 foot a minute descent that made a four degree angle? All you know is that you're high. And so it's something you might try, but what happens if you can't make that safe landing? So that's why you'll see a lot of airlines, a lot of transport category operators consider a VDP essentially mandatory. If you do not have conditions to land and can, if you can't start your descent by the visual descent point for a runway, then they say you need to treat that as the point where you start your missed approach. But of course, under part 91, you can keep going all the way in, all the way to the missed approach point. Once you meet the missed approach point, that is where you're required to start your missed approach. Okay, so again, looking at a VDP, the concept is you would fly down final, if you, once you reach the VDP, which may or may not be in the GPS flight plan, so you need to think about that as you're, as you're monitoring your GPS distance. If you meet landing requirements, you'll start out of the way down, and if for some reason you don't meet landing requirements, at that point, you would start your missed approach. Okay, this also brings up oh, a good time for their first question. Okay, uh, got a first question here, and that is, how are missed approach points depicted on FAA plates? Good question. Let's pull this one up. Um, this is Scott's Bluff KBFF. And Colin, you said this is the, the VOR to 2-3. VOR to 2-3. That's a jet plate. Okay. So what you'll notice is that the FAA plate does depict both the visual descent point, VDP, here, but the missed approach point is drawn essentially by showing you on the profile view um, where, the, where the solid line on final transitions to the dash line for the missed approach. And the same thing is kind of indicated in the uh, in the plan view, um, but if you look at the profile view, it's essentially where the solid line stops and we switch to the dashes. And in this case, we could look at the distance. Um, we have the BFF 4 tack here, and that would be, to measure it, you would need to be 3.1 plus 1.5 miles, so 4.6 miles from the Scotts Bluff Vortac. That would be your missed approach point. They don't draw it quite as well, I think. You know, when you look at uh, a Jeppesen plate, let me go back here. They do a little bit better job of indicating it with the strong M. Uh, but again, on an FAA plate, you're really just looking for the transition. Oh. From the solid line to the dotted. And you might ask the question, how could you determine when you're here? Well, it doesn't have a certified DME distance. Uh, you'll notice BFF does 3.1. 
um, from the Vortac. So there's a couple of things you could do on this procedure. You still could use D GP or, uh, DME or GPS from BFF. At the same time, um, you could use timing. So you could look at those 4.6 miles, figure out your ground speed and time it. And you will notice if you look at a Jepson chart, I actually give you the timing from the VOR to the missed approach point for different speeds. So you could either compute that mentally or you could use uh, the, the chart at the bottom of a Jepson chart. Again, timing these I know has gotten to be a bit of a lost art, especially considering that everybody is using RNAV and GPS along with these to measure our distance. Uh, but when I started flying instrument operations, we did not have a GPS. In fact, they, they were just starting to put IFR certified GPSs in aircraft uh, and approaches weren't out yet. So it would be pretty common procedure, it was common and standard procedure to start your clock over the, missed, or over the final approach fix and time your way into the missed approach point. Okay, next question. Okay, Serge wants to know this, uh, with this approach that we've been looking at, the VOR to 2-3, when can you initiate your descent to MDA? Uh, is it immediately following the final approach fix? Good question, Serge. Yes, that's exactly right. And you can tell that by looking at the profile view. So if we look at the profile view, you'll see once we leave the VOR, you can see then it shows us coming down to the minimum descent altitude. And if you look at the bottom, the MDA here is published with local altimeter setting 4,500 feet. Uh, the H is the minimum descent height, uh, which is an AGL number after that. So that takes you down to 533 feet. That's when, so you can start your descent to that altitude as soon as you cross, in this case, the VOR, that's your final approach fix. Uh, from there, there's a couple techniques. So we talked about this visual descent point. And essentially, we can use the old dive and drive technique. And on the dive and drive technique, you're gonna go down to minimum descent altitude, and then you're gonna drive the aircraft in at MDA on final approach until you either reach your visual uh, descent point and either land or can't, um, and you may elect to go missed, or until you actually reach the required missed approach point where you could go missed. The other option that you have here is to use the FAA's published vertical descent angle. So the vertical descent angle essentially is an angle that will take you from the final approach fix down to the runway's touchdown zone, and it will take you through your minimum descent altitude it doesn't guarantee any obstacle clearance once you get below MDA. But if you fly that vertical descent angle and you meet requirements to land once you get to MDA, you can continue it all the way down to the runway. So essentially, you could think of it as a perfectly stabilized descent. We'll do a, uh, we're actually gonna do a show on this at Oshkosh and we'll do a separate course on this another night. But essentially, you can see that vertical descent angle is published right here. So I could either choose my own rate drop down, level out at MDA, and drive it in. Or I could fly this 3.1 degree angle from the final approach fix down to the MDA. And if I meet requirements to land, you'll notice that angle takes me right through my visual descent point. I could hold that angle all the way down to the runway. You'll notice on a JEP chart, they tell you that descent angle of three degrees, they give you at each one of your speeds, uh, your required descent rate. And keep in mind, um, when we're doing that, not all of these are three degrees. You'll find quite a few of these vertical descent angles uh, might be three and a half or four degrees. They are not necessarily a normal descent. So if you look at them in Aspen, uh, they can be up to seven degrees. I think it's six and a half there um, and steamboat seven degrees, which I would say for most aircraft, you still a seven degree descent would have a hard time landing straight in, but you could fly either of those down. Okay, so here's a good question. What happens if you're flying a procedure that does not have a published visual descent point? So let's see if we can find one of these. Okay, so in this case, the VOR DME to runway five doesn't have a published vis uh, visual descent point. So maybe you wanna to try to compute one. And so if you wanted to plan on a standard three degree glide slope, that's a pretty good way to do this. One of the th tricks that you'll learn is you plan on 100 feet per nautical mile for every degree of glide slope that you wanna land at. So you could either look up the, the VASI at the airport and see what it is, or 
you could simply, if you want to plan on maybe a three degree descent, you could look at that, okay? And so if you were to do a three degree VDP, what you know is for every mile back from the runway you go, you'll go up 300 feet. So now we just need to figure out how much distance we need to lose between the minimum descent altitude and the runway's threshold. Okay, so one of the really easy and simple ways to do this is just to take a look at the minimum descent altitude and height. So if we're using the local altimeter setting, it's 528 feet. Okay, so we're gonna descend down 528 feet. And the easiest way to do that is to take 528 and divide that by 300, 300 feet per nautical mile. So 528 divided by 300, you're gonna end up with 1.76. So in this case, you could design your own visual descent point right here, and that would be 1.8 miles from the runway. And that visual descent point would give you a three degree descent down essentially to the runway threshold. Now, we've got a question coming up and I'll grab it in just a second, but it's important to keep in mind that when you compute your own VDP or you use the FAA's published VDP, neither of the two protect you once you go below your minimum descent altitude. There could be obstacles in the middle of that flight path. There could be a tree or a pole or a hill that sticks up that prevents you from flying that descent down to the runway, even though you planned on it. So you need to be visually ready to avoid any obstacle once you descend down below MDA. Even though you're trying to fly a normal glide path, there's no assurance that you can. One of the things you can use is a VASI or a PAPI, but you need to make sure you're within the service limits and you need to check the airport facility directory to make sure those haven't been revised. But essentially, if you create your own VDP or if you use one of the published ones, once you're below MDA, as always, it's up to you to see and avoid any obstacles. Okay, what's the next question? All right, next up, my uh, question is this. Does following the CDFA angle guarantee passing through the visual descent point? They, I, I, that's a really good question. Um, VDPs are older than CDFAs. I believe that they will be co-located now, but I cannot guarantee it. Um, and CDFAs are a fairly new development. Um, ideally, they would be located together. I have yet to see a case where they're not, but there might be a scenario where you find one that, that doesn't quite line up. It's important to keep in mind um, with a continuous descent to final approach, that all they're doing is drawing a line from the final approach fix that crosses all of your step down requirements. So it won't take you below a step down. If you fly that angle, you'll, you'll stay above all of your minimums. Then takes you through MDA down to the touchdown zone. That angle could be incredibly steep. The FAA doesn't necessarily say, hey, this is something you could actually fly. And let's, let's take a quick look at one. I'm gonna pull up Steamboat. We'll start by looking at the FAA one here. So this is the steam bat, steam bat, steamboat RNAV procedure. You'll notice um, it's a circling only procedure, um, even though it really is fairly lined up with that runway. And the missed approach point, if you look at it, is right at the runway threshold. Uh, but the reason it's a circling procedure is because the vertical descent angle is 7.75 degrees. Departing PEXA, you need to descend, PEX is your final approach point, um, or final approach fix, you need to descend at 7.75 degrees to make it down to the runway's touchdown zone. Okay, well let's use a little basic math. Okay, the descent altitude, minimum descent altitude in category A or B is 8140, and you're flying from PEXA, you departed about 9,700 feet MSL. So, Let's say you wanted to fly this approach at 100 knots indicated, standard speed in SR-22. Um, you gotta add 2% per 1,000 feet MSL, roughly, of true airspeed. So even though I'm indicating 100 knots, I'm really going 120 knots true. And let's say the winds are calm. So now my ground speed's about 120 knots. That's about two miles a minute. 60 knots is one mile a minute. 120 knots is two miles a minute. If I have a seven, Point, this is 7.75, so let's just say 
roughly, I would say, maybe 7.8 or 8 degree descent angle. If I had an 8 degree descent angle, that's 800 feet per nautical mile. I'm going 2 nautical miles a minute. So I need to descend around 1,600 feet per minute to get from PEXA down to the runway threshold. Somewhere between really 15 and 1,600 feet a minute because it's 7.75. So somewhere between 15 and 1,600 feet a minute. And I'm doing that um, in bad weather down to probably an obscured runway. Not a very safe descent rate. So when you see a CDFA published, that does not necessarily mean that the angle is safe to fly or safe to land from. It just simply means that it will get you down to the threshold or the touchdown zone. Okay, next question. Okay, Daniel wants to know this. When can you descend from your MDA on a non-precision approach? Okay, so again, we're going back to those three things. You need to be in a position, a continuous position for a normal descent to landing. When we say that we're continuous, what we mean is you're not gonna level the airplane out. So we're not gonna go dip below MDA because we see some lower clouds ahead of us and we're like, oh dude, just get like 100 feet below MDA and then we'll level out there and fly it until we need to land. Nope. You need to be able to maintain a continuous and normal descent to landing. You need to have the required flight visibility. So as soon as you can see far enough from the airplane down to the runway to go, yeah, I can see more than like on this steamboat approach, the one and a quarter miles that I need to land, okay? Um, you have to have those two things. And then number three, as soon as you clearly have part of the runway's environment in sight, okay? So any of those 10 items we talked about, that's when you can descend. So if we were to go back, I'm going to jump back into that Scott's Bluff animation. You know, the reality is you could legally start your descent at the visual descent point. You could say, well, I don't know. I felt like I was in a normal descent in front of that. It's shallower than three degrees. It'd maybe be two and a half. But if you have the required visibility and the runway environment in sight, you could start down early and you could legally start down late as long as you consider it to be a nor normal descent to landing and you have the runway in sight and you have the required flight visibility. In practicality, a lot of new pilots, uh, as soon as they start to see the runway environment and they go, yeah, I can see I got the visibility, they'll start leaving MDA to land. And that's a bit of a mistake, you know, because we get excited. Oh yeah, I can see it. Let's go down to land. And we realize we're not even close to the visual descent point yet. It's better to stay at MDA till you get to the VDP and use that optional VDP to land. And if there isn't a VDP on a non-precision approach, it's always a good idea to calculate one. It makes things a lot easier. Otherwise, if you didn't calculate a VDP, and you can see the VASI or the PAPI. Once you've got the PAPI in sight and you have the, and you have the visibility requirements, that's oftentimes a good time to descend. Once you're on the PAPI or the VASI glide slope, that can make it an easy way to fly in. Okay, this all brings up the scenario of what happens if you continue past the visual descent point. And there's a lot of reasons why commercial operators will prohibit approaches um, after the VDP. There's a lot of reasons why they'll, re why they'll require the crew to start the missed approach point at the VDP. Keep in mind, they can't turn yet. They need to continue straight along final to the missed approach point, but they will immediately start their climb. And one of that is so, one of the reasons uh, a lot of transport carrier pilot or transport category pilots will start the mist at the VDP is so they don't try to make a landing that you couldn't actually perform. Okay, so what would happen if the aircraft starts down and then realizes it can't make the landing and you decide to go miss? Well, what you can see here, all of these dashed orange lines, that is your required climb gradient. And as I start my missed approach point, the problem is I'm no longer, or start my missed approach below MDA, I am no longer afforded any obstacle protection. And it's not that I need to get back up to MDA before I get obstacle protection. I actually need to cross that climbing plane before I get obstacle protection. So that's the concern. If you go missed, if you execute a missed approach below MDA or past the missed approach point, you're no longer afforded obstacle protection and you need to get back on the missed approach course and 
you need to be above that climbing required climb gradient before you've got safe obstacle protection. So keep in mind that climb gradient climbs at 200 feet per nautical mile. And in a lot of places, if you're flying a light single engine airplane, you know, if you're going 120 knots, that would be 400 feet per minute. Um, you're probably going to be able to climb faster than that, unless it's high DA, but maybe not much. You might only be able to climb at 500 or 600 feet a minute. So it could take you a very long time to get the aircraft back up against that, above that 200 foot per nautical uh, mile climb expectation. Okay, next question. Next up, Joel wants to know this. Does the VDP provide obstacle clearance? Great question. It does not. The VDP only says that the descent from MDA to the runway would be fairly normal. Normally about three degrees, though they're oftentimes tied to the VGSA. So if it's three and a half, you might find it, you know, the if the VGSI is programmed at three and a half degrees, the VDP might be three and a half degrees. But it's there to give you a normal descent to landing. It does not mean that your landing gear won't go through a bird's nest on the way down. And so this is one of the things, this really surprises pilots when we start to talk about what level of protection you're really afforded below MDA or even DA. And the answer is not much. Now, on an on a ILS, they do certify that the obstacle plane is clear. They go through and measure that. But that doesn't mean that a tree might have grown between there. Think about it. You know, trees grow, especially in you know Pacific Northwest, they can grow very, very quickly. So anytime you go below MDA or DA, you are afforded zero protection. You need to be looking out for obstacles all the way into the runway. Even if they've surveyed the obstacle plane clear, the FAA basically says it is 100% your responsibility once you go below your DA to see and avoid all obstacles. Again, that's one of the reasons why if you really can't see anything, you want to be careful about descending below MDA because, you know, I, I kind of see the runway. Okay, can you see the trees and everything else? Do you feel safe that you're not going to hit any obstacles? That, that's a key point. Okay, next question. Uh, we didn't have any more questions. I just didn't turn the light off. <laughs> we do, but they're all ILS questions. Okay, we'll get to that in a second. What I wanted to uh, kind of emphasize here um, when we're looking at this missed approach point and descending below MDA. Again, if you're in instrument training, you really never think about this because you're wearing the plastic cloud most of the time and you can try to make the, air, uh, the landing and you know the approach. And so we kind of just try to dive it all the way into the runway once you see the airport. Uh, we don't worry about VDPs. But in the real world, there is significant danger if you try that and you realize you can't land. And keep in mind, you know, a lot of procedures will take you down to, you know, 400 feet above the ground. And it's kind of easy to estimate your descent rate, though in bad weather it can be hard. Then you'll have other procedures, like the uh, approach into, steam, uh, into uh, Telluride or into Aspen, that, that get you a couple thousand feet above the ground. There is no way that you can visually estimate in bad weather whether you can make that landing. In, in airports with high MDAs, you also have lots of terrain and sometimes increased climb gradient requirements on the mist. So you really need to be sure that you can stick the landing when you descend below MDA. That's really, really important because it can be very hard to get back above your climb gradient requirement if you start that below MDA or if you start that past the mist approach point. Okay, Colin, you want me to go into DA or take the question now? Uh, no, we actually, we just got two more MDA questions. Let's hit them. Okay, let's go for it. Okay, so uh, we're going to start off with Danny here, and he wants to know this. Can you shoot the approach and land if the reported visibility is less than what's required on the chart? Good question. The answer is under Part 91, absolutely. Under Part 91, you can fly a procedure, you can start a procedure, no matter what kind of weather is reported. It could be reported zero, zero. And under part 91, you can start that procedure, okay? And people say, uh, a lot of people who are experienced with the airlines will say, wait a second, I don't know if you can do that. Part 121 and 135 are completely different. They need the weather to be above minimums before they can start the procedure. But under part 91, you can start the procedure while the reported weather is below minimums. And the FAA has nothing against that. You'll hear people say, oh no, they'll come after you for safe and uh, careless operation or careless and reckless. No, they won't. It, you can start the approach 
even with lower than minimum reported weather. Okay, what you, you can land even with lower than minimum reported weather. You need to have the required flight visibility. You need to be, you need to be the judge. Okay, so people go, well, you know, will the FAA come after you if it's reporting a quarter mile and you made a landing, but you could see all the way down the runway? And the answer is, first of all, they'll probably never know. Okay, second of all, those are the kinds of things that the FAA usually finds out about because you have an accident. And then they start to look at it. But the reality is, as a pilot, you want to trust your own judgment. And so if you're flying in and ASOS is reporting a mile and you pop out of a layer and you can clearly see four miles, yes, you can continue to land the airplane on the runway. The next thing that I would do is I would file a pilot report. Not really just to protect you, but to let other pilots in the area know that the weather isn't necessarily matching the report. Especially if an aircraft's looking for uh, an emergency alternate or something like that, it's good to have accurate weather reports. Once you get into Part 121 and 135, those rules change. But under Part 91, the reported weather is essentially advisory on an approach, and it's your eyes and your flight visibility that matters. Okay, next question. Okay, next up from Joel, he's got a, a really good question here, and it has to do with uh, what you were showing before with going below MDA and then going missed. He says this, don't you still have departure obstacle protection from the runway you're approaching just like you would if you're taking off from that runway? That is a great point, and the answer is absolutely you do. You would, you would definitely have the diverse uh, departure area ODP protection. Um, what really starts to happen, though, is the ODP requirements, first of all, if there is a textual departure procedure, may not line up with the missed approach point and path. And so um, even though that's been evaluated for the airport, it may require a departure to do something different. Um, and so your missed approach path may take you outside of the safe limits. There are cases where approaches will take you into a runway that you are not allowed to depart from under IFR. Um, so you're right. Um, and, and in many cases, you would have departure area obstacle protection that would protect you on the missed approach path as well. But not in all. The, the airport's departure uh, may require you to go in a different direction. The missed approach point or path may not follow that, and so you could still be in an area where, where you're dangerously close to obstacles. Okay, let's take a look at DA. We talked about MDA, and let's talk about the difference between MDA and DA. It's not just the difference between a non-precision approach and then a precision or approach with vertical guidance. It's really how we treat it. Because in a decision altitude, we're going to follow our electronic glide path indication all the way down. That could be glide slope or a glide path in an RNAV unit. We're going to take that all the way down until we reach our bottom decision altitude. That is where we make our decision to continue landing or initiate the missed approach. So what the FAA is acknowledging is that when we do this, we'll actually go just a little bit below the decision altitude. Here, I'm gonna do that like this. We're gonna go just a little bit below DA before we start climbing again. And so when you think about an MDA, when you're flying it, you're gonna start the power up, you're gonna start the level off and gently bring the aircraft down to MDA. So you'll let that descent rate gently shallow out so you don't go below MDA. DA is different. You're going to fly that constant glide path, holding that descent rate until you get to that altitude. And then at that altitude, you're going to make the decision. And at that altitude, you either bring the throttle up and take the aircraft around, or you can continue down to land. And so as you do that, the aircraft will briefly transition below DA. Okay, next question. Serge wants to know, are DH and DA the same? They are, they're just expressed in two different types of altitude, right? Your DA is your decision altitude, and your DH is your decision height. Your DA is MSL, your DH is AGL. 
Um, and we really start to think of DHs in, in aircraft that use radio altimeters, CAT2 and CAT3 operations, where your radio altimeter will tell you how high you are, and that gives you a much more accurate reading than your barometric altimeter. And so you'll hear DHs there, you know, DH 100 feet or 50 feet. But you can also say, yeah, my decision altitude is 8,000 MSL, and two, my decision height is 200 feet AGL. Um, in category one operations, we don't use decision height as much simply because we don't have an accurate way to measure it in most of our aircraft. Next question. Bram wants to know this. How do you know where the missed approach, the, excuse me, how do you know where the missed approach point is if you're using an ILS instead of a GPS non-precision missed approach point? Great question. If you're flying an ILS, the missed approach point is your decision altitude. It is not a specific point on the ground. It's your decision altitude. Okay, so what that really means is when we think about an MDA, we're, we can level off. We have no legal obligation to go missed until we reach the published missed approach point. On an ILS, on the other hand, once you reach DA, you are legally obligated to start your missed approach procedure if you do not meet the requirements to land and if you do not decide to continue down to landing. So on an ILS, your missed approach point is always your decision altitude. On any approach with certified vertical guidance, LNAV, VNAV, uh, Barrow VNAV, LPV, ILS, MLS, any of those certified vertical guidance items, your decision altitude is always your missed approach point. Okay, so let's just take a look uh, quickly in an example um, of an ILS. I'll grab the... Um, ILS into Newport, okay? So if you look at this here, um, you'll notice though, you could also fly it as a localizer. Um, and yep, you could do the localizer which has a different decision altitude. And so in that case, I'm actually gonna use, it's a better example. <clears throat> I like how Jepson publishes this because it makes it very, very clear. But you can see in that case, they've drawn this missed approach point here at DME 0.7 from Newport. And if you were flying this with the GPS, you would see D07 is the missed approach point. If you were flying the ILS and you reach decision altitude, you will reach it prior to that missed approach point. However, on the ILS, that's where you need to start the missed approach. That's where you will start your climb. However, you will not start your turn, okay? In this case, you look straight up to 1,000 feet, then a right turn, but in general, you won't start a lateral deviation from the final approach course until you pass the non-precision missed approach point. So essentially, you wouldn't start turning until you've reached the map at D0.7. So, even on an ILS, you're on an ILS, you take it down to DA, and I don't see anything, I gotta start my missed approach point. I start my climb immediately on the missed approach procedure, but then I would start lateral navigation once I cross the published missed approach point. Okay, next question. All right, Jay wants to know this. He says, I've been told that on an LPV approach, you use DA because it's considered a precision approach. I think you indicated that you should use MDA. Is that the case or is it DA? No, you're right, it is DA. So an LPV, so let's go through those. The LNAV, VNAV, an LPV, or an ILS um, are all approaches with certified vertical guidance. And so if you look at the minimums published for them, they are a decision altitude minimum. So you'll use a DA. Where that starts to change and get confusing in the GPS world is plus V. So if you've ever loaded a GPS procedure and you see that it says plus V, that's advisory vertical guidance. Plus V is not certified. The FAA doesn't look at it. They have nothing to do with it. Plus V guidance does not change your MDA. You still fly down to a minimum descent altitude. But if you're flying an ILS, an LPV, or an LNAV, VNAV, then you're gonna fly down to a decision altitude. And 
And again, you know, one of the things that we talk about um, is once you get to that, whether it's a DA um, or if you're down to the M, uh, Mr. Pro or MDA, if you decide to go missed prior to the missed approach point, you want to start your climb, but continue flying along final until you cross the published missed approach point and then start flying the missed approach procedure. Okay, next question. You just answered the question, but I'm thinking maybe we can just draw this out on an approach yeah, chart. Let's try that Brand out. wants to know if your perno and here's his question, and it's actually a really good point to bring up here. What he says is if your if your personal minimums are higher than the DA or MDA for that matter, what's the best way to figure out where you start your missed approach? Can I climb early? Can I turn early? So that is a perfect question. Um, first of all, you can always climb early. You can always start your climb to the missed approach altitude. Um, and I'll give you a really good example. Uh, Colin and I were flying a back course in, uh, was it Salem or Corvallis? Salem. Salem. Salem, Oregon. Yeah. And we turned onto the back course and we were filming it. Uh, so the autopilot was flying actually on this one. And all of a sudden we started to get course galloping. We had just left the final approach fix. We were even close to ND MDA, but the back course was swinging around about half scale left and right. And of course now the autopilot's trying to follow it and we're in IMC. And so, you know, I took it off and, and kind of stabilized it, but you can just see this, the localizer is just flying left and right. And we're like, yeah, I, we're not gonna continue this procedure clearly uh, because it's gonna be impossible to track the localizer. So the first thing we did is we started our climb to the missed approach altitude. And then we did our best to kind of hold the center of that low course where we called ATC and let them know we were flying a missed approach. But that's a key. You can always start your climb to the missed approach altitude. You need to remain on the lateral course all the way until you reach the missed approach point. Then you can start your turns and start flying the missed approach procedure. Um, and if you get high enough, like what happened in, I think it was Salem or Corvallis, um, approach started vectoring us early. But otherwise, you may find that you're flying that missed approach procedure almost at your top missed approach altitude, which is, which is fine. The key thing is that obstacle protection is really only provided on the route. So if we were to take a look at, let's take a look at this Newport, Oregon ILS. Okay, let's say something went wrong. Uh, maybe, we, maybe we have a 400 foot personal decision altitude. So, you know, that's maybe right here. Um, and we start that turnout early. There is no obstacle protection there. And there could be a tower or something like this on the, on the jetty in the Columbia River. And so because of that, you would never want to do that. Instead, what you would do, if this was the point you elected to start your missed approach, is you would just climb, again, continue until you cross that published missed approach point, runway threshold or DME 0.7 from Newport, and then you would just fly the published missed approach higher than, higher than expected, essentially. Okay, next question. Okay, next up, Robin wants to know, if we descend to 100 feet above touchdown zone elevation, like you see the approach lights, but you don't see anything else, when do you go missed? That is a really, really good question. Um, the answer is you're kind of in a gray zone down there. Um, and this is something I always caution people. Again, you know, if you don't really, if you don't really see the approach lights, if you just kind of think you see them, you may not want to go down because you could end up outside of that obstacle protection and, and in a tough zone. But the answer is if you do start that descent uh, with just the white lights in sight, you would go missed under a couple scenarios. Number one, you lose sight of those white lights and you do not see the runway markings. So that would be one. You lose that visual reference. As soon as that's gone, you need to start your climb and your missed approach procedure, okay? Uh, number two, your flight visibility degrades. So let's say you're landing in mist that starts to turn to fog. You could see down that 6,000 foot runway plus some, and then all of a sudden you can only see about 500 feet in front of you um, and you don't meet visibility requirements then you would immediately need to start your missed approach. And then if at any point in time, you're like, yeah, I'm no longer in a normal position to descend. So you see the runway lights and you realize this is a short runway and there's no way I'm gonna be able to descend down anymore. I need to start my missed approach. Essentially, you know, the reason they put those white lights there is 
the idea is that you'll be able to see that at least the white runway lights or something by the time you get to the end of the approach lighting system. But if you can't, you know, if you lose the reference to the approach lights and you can't see anything else, you need to start your mist. Okay, next question. Next up, uh, and this goes back to the non-precision approaches, where Robin wants to know this. If the distance to the threshold from the VDP is greater than the available RVR or flight visibility, how do you proceed? That normally would not happen, um, but if it does, you cannot, you couldn't use the VDP because at minimums, essentially, and it could, I guess it could happen. I'm trying to think of an approach where I've seen that. It, it could possibly happen, um, but the reality is if the weather was at minimums, you would not be able to use the visual descent point. Um, and one of the things to think about oftentimes with these procedures is, you know, a circling option. Um, if you, if you still meet, if you meet circling minimums, you could always plan to do a circling approach, um, which allows you not to try to fly a straight in, but allows you to maybe join a pattern. And in some cases that actually can make landing easier. Um, but the reality is if the weather is right at minimums and you reach the VDP and you don't have the required visibility or you can't see the runway ahead of you, you couldn't use the VDP. You have to keep flying along MDA, and then decide once you do see the runway, can I still make a normal descent to landing? Next question. Okay, we've got another really good one here. Uh, and that is, uh, I agree with everything you've said about LPVs and using DA or DH. However, how do you reconcile that with the fact that you can't use an LPV for the 602 precision minimums for an alternate approach? That's a great question. When we started putting RNAV procedures in the National Airspace System, we really screwed everything up from a point of teaching because everything was so simple before RNAV. I mean, precision approaches were approaches with glide slopes, and there were ILSs and MLSs, and that was the end of it. And then everything else fell into the non-precision world. And then as we started adding LNAVs and LPVs, it started to confuse people. So it, it, myself included. So the FAA created the concept of, I think AKO did as well, approaches with vertical guidance or APV. And essentially they're not a precision approach. So they cannot follow the precision approach minimums, but you're still using an electronic glide slope guidance. That glide slope or glide path is being generated by WAS and the GPS or by barrow aiding as, as opposed to by a glide slope indicator. Uh, or a glide slope radio. But that vertical certified guidance means that you can fly down to a DA. The reason those are not considered precision approaches has nothing to do with the DA and everything to do with the certification, redundancy, and equipment requirements for an IKO precision approach. Um, essentially, an LPV doesn't meet all of the IKO requirements to be considered a precision approach. Uh, and that could be a variety of things. It could be runway or all kinds of stuff like that. And so because it doesn't meet ICAO requirements to be considered a precision approach, you cannot use precision alternate minimums. You need to use non-precision minimums. And if you really get into it in the AIM, essentially what they say, whether you're WAS certified um, or, or not, when you're considering an RNAV procedure for an alternate, you need to plan on using either the LNAV only minimums, or if your aircraft is Barrow VNAV equipped, you can consider the Barrow VNAV minimums. And essentially what they're trying to say there is, don't count on GPS for an alternate glide slope. We're not sure if you'll be able to get it. So they want you to be able to land off the non-precision minimums only. The reason Barrow VNAV is thrown into the aim there is because Barrow VNAV is entirely independent essentially of GPS. It just uses barometric pressure to draw a barometric glide path down to a decision altitude. Um, but that's why they're using non-precision minimums because the FAA is saying, yeah, you know, Yes, if you've got the vertical guidance, you can use it down to the DA, but there's a chance it may not be there. WAS could be out. And so we don't want you considering that for an alternate. Okay, next question. Next up, we're going to put you on the spot for a couple of questions, but I think we're going to be okay here. Uh, we have a couple uh, specific questions about approaches at different airports. Um, okay. So the first one is at KDAB. Uh, and the question is this. We're looking at the ILS the ILS and LOC to 7 left at KDAB. 
Uh, and here's Ian's question. He said, if you're shooting the localizer, how would you correctly identify the ZO prefix in a G-1000 equipped aircraft? Okay, so great question. Zopri is a named fix in this case. And so um, in a G-1000 equipped aircraft, I would use the, first of all, you would load the um, GPS flight plan. So let's quickly talk about, oh, we're bouncing back and forth between cameras. <laughs> Sorry about that. that <laughs> yeah. Um, let's just quickly talk about RNAV substitution because that's going to help clarify the answers here. Because you're, you're asking about a G-1000. Okay, so... Um, in a G-1000 aircraft, as long as the aircraft has GPS that meets requirements, you've got RAM and WAS and everything is running, okay, you can use RNAV to substitute for VORs, NDBs, and distances from VORs and NDBs. And so therefore, we can, and distances from named fixes. So we can always use RNAV. And I use the word RNAV, we always equate it to GPS, but there are other systems that it could be as well. So RNAV, you could use RNAV that's properly certified, G1000 style, to identify any of the named fixes on a procedure. So if I'm flying a procedure in a G1000 equipped aircraft, I will always load the procedure through the database. And the reason I do that, even if I'm gonna fly the entire thing using VHF green needle navigation, is because the distance information that I get to each of those name fixes is legal and usable even if it's just a VHF based procedure. What I cannot use RNAV to do is legally navigate a published localizer course. RNAV is not suitable or, or approved for navigating a localizer course. So let's go take a look at this. If I was to load this procedure through the G1000's database and then fly this green needles, I legally need to be green needles once I turn on to the low course. So um, let's say I flew, let's just take a look at the arc. I love arcs. Um, so, you know, I could use RNAV to navigate this arc, but the moment I turn on here, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna get really high tech and RNAV will be red. So I can use RNAV all the way along the arc. And the moment I turn on to the localizer, now I need to be green needles through the localizer procedure. So I'm green, but I can use RNAV's distance to tell me once I'm at Zopri. Okay, so what happens um, if we didn't have that? Well, you'll notice, looks like on this, there is no DME um, from the, let's see. Yeah, there's no DME from the ILS. And so you'll notice there are no DME. Yeah, the DME here is from OMN, um, which is Ormond Beach and offset VOR. So you can't use DME to identify Zopri, um, you can use, sorry, the crossing radial. So OMN radial 179, okay? Um, and the easiest way to do this in a G1000 equipped aircraft, especially in Annex I, is to put the VOR up on your bearing pointer. So typically, when I'm flying with the G1000 equipped aircraft and I'm flying a procedure, I usually fly from the right seat. I always have bearing pointer number two set to the GPS so that the distance information that bearing pointer number two and the waypoint always relates to my supply plan. I like that because it's in the lower right corner of the HSI. And so as I'm scanning, I don't have to scan up to the top by the radio bar. I can keep my eyes centered on the HSI altitude and airspeed tapes and it keeps my scan really, really tight, and I got my GPS distance right in that bottom right corner. So that would tell me when I'm getting up to Zopri. And then the other advantage with the bearing pointer, I don't know if you've ever had this problem, uh, but when you cross a missed approach point, you start to, you look down and you see point two. Okay, wait a second. Is it point two miles to the missed approach point, or am I just a little slow and I've already crossed over it? The advantage about that GPS bearing pointer is it will flip upside down and tell me that the point is behind me now. So I, I like that. But then what you could do is you could put Ormond Beach in nav one and you could set bearing pointer number one over to Ormond Beach. And once that bearing pointer hits 179 degrees, then you know you're at Zopri. Um, on the G1000 NXIs, it actually tells me my bearing in numbers. I do not know if the original G1000 does it, but that would be another way to identify it. Um, 
the missed approach point is a little bit tougher. With RNAV, you could simply, del with RNAV, there will be a runway missed approach point. So in this case, it would be RW07 um, or RW7 would be the GPS's missed approach point. And essentially that will, it, it just takes the lateral distance. So 2.9 plus 1.9 and puts a missed approach point there. But if you didn't have RNAV, if your GPS was out, how would you figure out that missed approach point? Because there is no cross radial from Orman that goes to the missed approach point. All you've got is distance. And if you look down here, it's 4.8 miles. So if you're flying the procedure at 90 knots with no wind, it's three minutes and 12 seconds from the final approach fix full lug down to the missed approach point. Um, even with the G1000. If you didn't have RAIM or WAS, if you couldn't use your GPS, then what you're down to is the clock. Okay, next question. Next airport that we're looking at, David's got a question about the Van Nuys Airport, which is KVNY. We're looking at the ILS Zulu to runway 16, and this is really interesting. I was just looking at it over here. Uh, his question is this, does Van Nuys have a missed approach that requires a descent if you start the missed approach early. And uh, I'm just going to, if you haven't seen it already, Alex, here, if you look at, yeah, the, I'm looking at the ball note there, the plan view right there, it talks about the, uh, and if you look just above it on the plan view, it discusses the missed approach. So let's take a look here. And it's at uh, D1.5, VNY at or below 1750 on the missed approach. That's a great, great, now this is something I've never seen, but... Um, the hint is in the missed approach verbiage. So let's just take a look at this missed approach verbiage right here. Um, missed approach. Let me bring up a pencil. There we go. Climbed across D1.5 VNY um, south of the Van Nuys VOR at or below 1750. Then climbing left turn to 4600 outbound on VNY VOR 152 to Hirvi or DME 0.8 VNY. Then direct SMO VOR and outbound on SMOR VOR 267, and then inbound on the VTUR VOR 087 to VTU and hold. This is one of those procedures you really would want to fly using RNAV um, or have a good co-pilot who can spin those for you. But I see exactly what they're saying. In this case, they're probably using that, at, um, that, that altitude restriction for traffic separation. So this is a very rare case. Um, figures that it's at Van Nuys in California. This is the kind of place where you'd find something like that. But the reality is if you executed your missed approach early, then you would still need to comply with the missed approach altitude requirement. So if you started your missed approach above that, you would need to descend down to um, 1,750 feet and hold that or slightly below until you meet that climbing left turn requirement. So this is really uncommon. Um, but what it does bring up is the fact that in the national airspace system, um, most things are fairly standard, but not all of them. And so you'll find some kind of funny things like this, some one-off procedures where you look all over the United States, you won't find another one even remotely like it. Um, but if you read the missed approach, it makes it very, very clear. And this is another thing. People ask, when do you brief your approach? I don't usually brief my approach on departure uh, because oftentimes we're on a three or four hour leg and that's a, that's a lock and change. Uh, you don't even always know which approach you'll use. I do make sure that there are usable approaches at the airport and the runway's long enough. Um, but I typically brief my approach once I start my arrival. So about 100, maybe 150 miles out sometimes. Um, and I get that briefing done very early because if there's something like this in a missed approach plate, I want to be able to catch it while I'm basically sitting happy in cruise or on a basic high altitude descent. I don't want to try to figure this out as I'm crossing an initial approach fix. So that kind of the training world, um, which we're all used to where you're doing approach after approach after approach, and you're literally given the briefing right as you cross the initial approach fix. In the line flying world, when you actually get out there and use those instrument ratings, you want to brief early. I like to get the weather really early, and if I can't get the weather right away from, um, from ASOS or AWOS because I'm out of range, I'll use ADSB to give myself kind of a pre-weather. I, I still always pick up the minute weather, um, but then I start that briefing early so you can pick up stuff like this. Okay, next question. 
Okay, we're back to a uh, Barrow VNAV question here, uh, and it's this. Isn't the Barrow VNAV created and carried over from using the older and now outdated GPS systems? Uh, I don't see the Barrow VNAV in most GA that use Garmin G1000, G2000, the 530s, and the 430s with WAS. Can you explain? Good question. It is a carryover, but it still has a purpose. And um, the purpose is if WAS was to go away, it gives you another option. So let me pull up, I'm gonna pull up a, a Barrow and VNAV approach. How about, um, I'll go to Eugene, and I think it's the, yeah. Okay, so if we switch to the iPad, you're gonna see three different landing minimum here. Again, you're gonna see a LPV decision altitude, an LNAV VNAV decision altitude, which is about 30 some, little under 30 feet higher, and then a significantly higher LNAV only minimum descent altitude. And so LNAV VNAV doesn't get as quite as low as the LPV does, you know, it's, it's still above that, but it is definitely lower than the LNAV option. So when would we use this? Let's say WAS failed, and you still were able to generate RAIM, but you could not get WAS. Again, the two are separate, and a G1000 system can do both. So the aircraft is able to provide RAIM, but not able to provide WAS. It can't provide LPV. That's when you would see LNAV VNAV. So when you go to load the procedure, you'll notice that it never says LNAV VNAV. And that's because the GPS knows right now, hey, I've got WAS, I don't have any problem. So I'm gonna show you an LPV. If for some reason WAS had failed, if it did not have the satellite information to provide WAS, when you went to load that procedure, you'd actually see LNAV VNAV. And the interesting thing is, and we'll do a video on this shortly, um, if you were to lose WAS as you started the procedure, on a G1000 outside of 60 seconds from the final approach fix, it will roll into LNAV VNAV as long as it still can provide RAIM. So essentially, you know, if you're on the intermediate segment, you're still more than 60 seconds from the final approach fix and the WAS satellite goes out and you're just left with basic old GPS and it's like, okay, yep, I've got RAIM. You'll see that HSI will switch from a purple LPV, it'll go to a yellow LNAV VNAV to catch your attention. And then it will go back to a purple LNAV VNAV. So, you know, the question is, is it a carryover? Kind of, but really what you want to think of it as is a fail safe. If for some reason you can't get WASP, but you still have basic GPS RAIM, then your aircraft, if it's Barrow VNAV equipped, will be able to provide LNAV VNAV. Um, and if it's not Barrow VNAV equipped, then it would fall back just to LNAV. And of course, if you lose all of your satellites and you have nothing, that's a great time to use the minimum safe or minimum sector altitudes. Okay, that's all the time we've got for tonight. Um, but uh, let me go back to our presentation here because um, our Oshkosh schedule is out. Uh, we're gonna be speaking at the EAA Pilot Proficiency Center. That's where they have all the simulators. It's kind of on the main plaza. Uh, we're gonna be speaking Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday doing three live classes. Uh, all of them are at 1245. It's the last class before the air show. Um, so you have all the opportunity to have lunch and then show up and sleep through these classes. Uh, the first one on Monday is Mastering Crossword Landings. The second one on Tuesday is Obstacle Departure Procedures. And then the third one on Wednesday is how to get comfortable with stalls. They're completely free. Uh, they're, they're presented in partnership with EAA and Jeppesen. Um, I really love doing them. It's one of the few times we really get to stand in front of a large group of people and do something that's truly live. So if you're going to be at Oshkosh Monday or Tuesday and Wednesday, I really hope to see you at the EAA uh, Pilot Proficiency Center. There's no need to RSVP. You just need to show up. Uh, and last but not least, if you learned something, if you like this video tonight, uh, press like. Uh, it helps Google and YouTube know that these are quality videos and increases our search rank. And we always like to hear your comments. So send us emails at info at boldmethod.com or support at boldmethod.com. There's also a link in the description. Tomorrow night on, uh, IFR, or on Bold Method Live Pro Pilot, we're going to talk about critical Mach numbers and sweep back a little bit. So um, if you're thinking about going to an airline and you really haven't ever had an intro into high-speed aerodynamics, we're going to give you a good overview of wing sweep and critical Mach 
uh, that should be able to help you out in a regional airline interview. Otherwise, if we don't see you tomorrow, have a great night. We'll see you in a couple weeks.